When it comes to healing, there are two streams of healing. The first stream of healing is prayer. And the second stream of healing is the healing anointing. And we need to understand what the Bible teaches on the subject of healing, which is really not the context of my teaching here tonight. I shared on the children's bread. Healing is the children's bread this morning concerning the communion table of the Lord. But when you study the subject of healing, you'll begin to see that there are two streams of methods of healing found in Scripture. So go with me to James chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. It says, Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed any sins, he shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So you can see many times Christians don't get healed because of unconfessed sin. It becomes a hindrance, a blockage to the release of the anointing and the power in your life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then go with me to Mark Chapter 5, I'm sorry, let me finish that verse, by the way. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So the prayer of faith, we can see the prayer of faith, anointing with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and heal the sick. Then Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. And a certain woman who had an issue of blood of 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians, sounds like today, not much has changed. And had spent all that she had. She probably went to the ER with a headache and got a bill for 50 grand. <laughs> Welcome to the broken system in America. Which had an issue of blood of 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse when she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body. So she felt, what does that mean? A tangible anointing. She felt in her body a tangible anointing that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power or the anointing had gone out of him. So he also felt the power being released. The anointing is transferable. And the woman, the woman came and made contact. A touch of faith, a point of contact where her faith was released. And immediately Jesus, knowing in himself that virtue or power or dunamis, or anointing, had flowed out of him, turned about in the press. And of course, he asked who touched my clothes. The disciples were confused. In verse 34, when he did find the woman, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of this plague. So your faith has made you whole. What was it that made the woman whole was her faith. For she said, she said in herself, if I may just touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. That was her faith confession. She confessed in faith, but she didn't just confess it. She also acted on it by going and touching the hem of his clothes. And the woman felt in her body. So the anointing is tangible. So the healing anointing is tangible. She, she felt a tangible anointing. And Jesus also felt a tangible anointing. So in this, the two passages of scriptures that we just looked at in James and then here in Mark, we see, now notice, Jesus never prayed for the woman. Jesus never prayed for, there was no prayer. There was no prayer involved here. Yeah, the woman was confessing what she was believing, but she acted on what she believed touching the hem of his garment, 
Jesus never prayed for the woman, but the healing anointing flowed out from him, touched the woman, and the Bible says straight away, that means instantly, the fountain of her blood or the issue of her blood, the flow of blood of 12 years was dried up. She was instantly healed. So you can see there was no prayer. There was no prayer that released the anointing. It was simply faith, a touch of faith that released the anointing. What was the anointing that was released? It was the healing anointing because that's what the woman needed. Amen. A whole bunch more money wasn't released so she could go see maybe some other doctors. No, she didn't need that. She had already spent all of her money and was no better and suffered many things of many physicians. Amen. So in James, we see the stream of prayer. The first stream of healing is prayer. And the second stream of healing we see is ministering under the anointing. Now, how is it that the woman tapped into the healing anointing? Because Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And one of the things he said as a result of the anointing on his life was healing. Healing those that are brokenhearted, healing, setting the captives free. The woman was a captive. The woman needed healing, and so the anointing on the life of Jesus flowed out of him into the woman to heal her. Both will bring the same results, whether it's the prayer of faith, anointing with oil. What is the prayer of faith? There is no if, and, or but in the prayer of faith. A lot of people don't understand the prayer of faith. They take what is the prayer of consecration and try to pray it over sick people. And I shared about the, the, all, the different kinds of prayer on Wednesday night here. Go back and watch the Wednesday night service. But there are different kinds of prayer. Now, there is something called the prayer of consecration. It's the time that Jesus prayed. And the only one time we see it is in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, Lord, if it be thy will. Father, if it's possible. There was an if. If it's possible, let this bitter cup pass from me. What was the bitter cup? He was about to drink this bitter cup of dying on the cross, a painful death. But he knew it was not possible. So for that reason, he prayed the prayer of consecration saying, Father, not my will, let your will be done. And then he submitted and committed himself to the journey of going to the cross, because it wasn't just that he suffered on the cross. I mean, they arrested him, they beat him, and then they scourged him and whipped him, and they mocked him and pulled out his beard, and they crucified him. So he took our infirmities on his own body, on the tree. Just like he took our sickness and disease, he took the curse, and by his stripes we were healed, which is what we looked at this morning. So the stream of prayer is the prayer of faith. What is the prayer of faith? That's Mark eleven twenty four. What things soever you desire or you demand when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. That is the prayer of faith. The moment you pray, you believe that you received it. That's the prayer of faith. There is no if. There is no if. Now, you'll hear the wrong kind of prayer you go out there sometimes to mainstream Christianity and the religious Christianity, they'll pray for the sick and Lord, if it be thy will. You don't pray for the sick, Lord, if it be thy will. We know God's will. It's God's will to heal all. So we pray the prayer of faith in the name of Jesus. We decree and demand and ask. And the word, whatever you ask, it's actually in the Greek also means whatever you demand. You need to place a demand just like the woman with the issue of blood placed a demand on the anointing by saying, I'm going to reach, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment, and I'm going to receive my healing. She placed a demand. And what was interesting, of course, we know that Jesus was in the crowd of people and many were thronging him. That means many people were touching him. And that's why the disciples were surprised when he said, who touched me? Master, don't you see the crowd of people? touching you 
He said, yeah, they're touching me, but they're just getting some sweat. But this woman got some anointing. That's why he looked around the sea. And of course, not only is, is the anointing tangible, but it's also visible. The woman was being touched by the anointing. She came trembling, fell at his feet and told him the whole story. Uh, that's why when I'm in the services, I can see who the anointing is on. And you can see who the anointing is on. Jesus saw that the anointing was on the woman. Now the healing anointing is available for all. Right? Luke chapter 5 verse 17. That had come out of every town of Galilee. Pharisees and doctors of the law and scribes the Bible says. And then people had gathered and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So there was a healing anointing flowing and anybody could come and receive healing. Amen. They had come out of every time. But the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the wooden seas and the couldn't seas, they were just standing by, it says. They were just standing by, spectating. That's why they didn't receive. They just were standing by and spectating. But then people that were Placing a demand on the healing anointing came and were healed because the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, when it comes to the st stream of prayer, it's the prayer of faith. It's the prayer of faith. That's why it says in James, let them call for the elders of the church or ministers, pastors, leaders. Let them pray for the sick and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It's interesting that the word save is used, which is sozo. Because it's not only saving when it comes to forgiving of sins, but the word sozo also means to make whole. So part of our salvation, sozo, is not just being forgiven of our sins, but also being healed and being made whole. Hallelujah. So the prayer of faith shall save, or sozo, the sick they shall be made whole they shall be saved and they shall be made whole notice forgiveness of sins once again and healing go together just like when they brought that lame man to Jesus asking right you know who sinned what did, what did he do wrong and then he says take up your bed and walk right and before that he said your sins are forgiven and they're like well, what do you mean? He's like, there's no difference between saying your sins are forgiven and take up your bed and walk. They're tied together. The same finished work on the cross not only delivered us from every curse and every sin, but also from every sickness and disease. That's why we pray the prayer of faith. You cannot pray the prayer of faith unless you have revelation. But once you know the word and the will of God, you can pray the prayer of faith. Now, when it comes to the healing anointing, so the prayer of faith releases the healing anointing, but then there's a stream of the anointing. There was a tangible anointing. And there are many times Jesus never even prayed for people. He just laid hands on them. As a matter of fact, when he went to Peter's house, his mother-in-law was lying with a fever. And the Bible says Jesus went and laid his hands on her. And she stood up, the fever left her, and then she went into the kitchen and cooked a good meal. You know a woman is healed when she cooks a good meal. <laughs> Praise God. But he never prayed for her. The Bible doesn't say he went there and knelt by her bedside and prayed. He just laid his hands on her. That was the stream of the anointing, the healing anointing flowing. Now, as we have been looking at the believer's authority, we know that Jesus said, in my name, go, lay hands on the sick. Those who believe, right, in my name, go lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's the healing anointing. He didn't say go pray for the sick. He said go lay hands on the sick. That's the healing anointing. And every believer can operate in the healing anointing. As you lay hands on the sick and the healing anointing can flow. But you have to be a believer. That means a place of faith. 
That means the moment you go lay hands on somebody, you are in a place of faith. You are believing for the healing anointing to flow. Amen. So concerning the believer's authority, there's the healing anointing that every believer can operate in. But then we also looked at the gifts of the spirit, the power gifts. If you remember, one of them is gifts of healings. Now those are as the spirit wills. So he can use certain people in the healing anointing, the gifts of healings. Then there's another side to it, which is what you need to understand. When you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the verse 28, it begins to talk about how God set first in the church apostles, apostles, then prophets, then teachers, thirdly teachers. After that, after that, workers of miracles and gifts of healings. Now those two is actually the office of the evangelist. Because when you look at Ephesians 4, 11, the fivefold ministry gifts of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, you come to 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and 29, the evangelist is not mentioned, but it is. The evangelist is mentioned as miracles and gifts of healings. So just as every believer can be used in miracles and gifts of healings, However, when it comes to the office of the evangelist, it's like that healing anointing just flows. Yeah. That's why evangelists, you see that they operate in a level of healings and miracles at a high level. Just like every believer can receive a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or the, the gift of discerning of spirits, those three revelation gifts can operate in the life of a believer. However, when it comes to the office of the prophet, those three operate regularly at a very high level. So that's what marks the office of the prophet and what marks the office of the evangelist is the healing anointing. Everywhere they go, it just flows because that's what they carry, the healing anointing. That's why when you have an evangelist, if someone is a true evangelist, there should be healings and miracles. They call themselves an evangelist and there are no healings and miracles, they ain't no evangelist. And then people call themselves prophets, but you don't, there are no words of knowledge, words of wisdom accurately and discerning of spirits, and then they're just non-profit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then people call themselves an, an apostle. They've never gone anywhere, never planted any work, yeah, right. but they got five people who meet in their garage and they're an apostle. No, they're not an apostle. They go to places, nobody knows them, and they go pioneer works, plant churches, establish people and raise them up in the ministry, and, that's the, that's, and then teach and, 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 uh, and then contend for a city, contend for a region, contend for sound doctrine, contend for the body of Christ. That's the, that's the ministry of the apostle. But then, you know, these days, of course, they grow on trees. Everybody's an apostle because they went to Office Depot and got a card that said, <laughs> apostle. And then it's not enough to be an apostle, now you got chief apostles. You got apostle to the apostles. My prophet to the prophets, pastor to the pastors. It's interesting, very few want to be teachers because somehow they think there's more glory or power, but the teacher, the, min the ministry gift of a teacher is so needed because the teacher needs to teach the evangelist and the prophet. Otherwise, they'll go way off. So, that's why all the fivefold ministry gifts need to operate together. So there's a stream of the anointing. And just like when Jesus said, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also. John 14, 12. And even great, greater works than these he shall do. Why? Because of the healing anointing. So we need to understand how the anointing works. That's why we teach on this subject so much here. And we look at Jesus' life and ministry, the three and a half years of earthly ministry in the Gospels. He used many methods of ministering healing. But the most prominent one was the laying on of hands. 
That's why everywhere he went, they brought him kids to lay hands on him. People literally lined up to have hands laid on him. Jesus was laying hands on people everywhere he went. He was laying hands on people. The laying on of hands was the, the preeminent method that he used to minister to the sick. Why? Because it was a point of contact through which the healing anointing is transferred. The laying on of hands is a point of contact for the release of the anointing. Amen. And in connection with the laying on of hands, we see, we see when people came to touch Jesus. He never got to lay hands on that woman that had the issue of blood. She said, well, I'm going to go lay hands on him and place a demand on the anointing. Hallelujah. She touched his garment. That's why Jesus said when he felt the virtue flow out of him, he turned about him in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Isn't that interesting? I mean, do your clothes have nerve endings that they send a signal to your brain? No. So how did he know that someone touched his clothes? Because he felt the power go out right at the hem of his garment. Right at the hem of his garment, he felt that power go out, the Bible says, flow out. So the healing anointing needs a point of contact to flow. And every believer can function and flow in the healing anointing because you've been told to go lay hands on the sick. So you don't have to go pray long prayers. Oh, Father, I come before you. You know this person. And then you tell them the whole story. And then 20 minutes later, and then, or people will come in the prayer line and they want to tell you their whole life story. I don't need to hear your life story. If for some reason they, they think that if they don't tell me everything, notice the woman told Jesus everything after she got healed. Bible says she told them the whole story. She never stopped them in the crowd and said, hey, I got to tell you my story. You know, I've been through a lot now. Jesus, you got to hear this out. Please just listen to me. And then, you know, three hours later. So people think that they got to come and tell you every, you know, all the, I don't need to know the story. I mean, I cannot even imagine. She went to so many physicians for 12 years. She could probably write a book. But a lot of times people will come and they want to tell you. I mean, I've had people really, really get upset with me because I prayed very short prayers. I was going down the prayer line praying for, and then, and I said, be healed in the name of Jesus. I'm moving, and the lady grabbed my arm and go, pray me a longer prayer, sonny, sonny boy. <laughs> It's like elderly. It's like she, she, she wanted a longer prayer because she thought the power was in the longer prayer. Maybe the longer the prayer, the more power. But that, that's just a religious mindset. And that shows me someone who doesn't understand the operation of the anointing and the prayer of faith. So the prayer of faith is, is right to the point. Oh, huh? Pray for me. I have cancer. You foul spirit of death and cancer, be thou removed. I pull you out by the roots right now in the name of Jesus. I curse every foul cancer cell in your body and I curse it. I command it just as Jesus commanded and cursed the fig tree to dry up from the roots and disappear, shrivel up and be gone and from your body. I send the fire of the Holy Ghost to burn it out of you. Be healed now in the name of Jesus. And that's it. I mean, that's how you pray the prayer of faith. You take authority over that thing. You speak to it. Hallelujah. And then people come and say, you know, uh, <laughs> pray for my diabetes. Is it yours? Why are you owning it? My. My back pain.
It's not yours. Don't own up to it. So the prayer of faith is straight to the point, takes authority, amen, and then the healing anointing is released. 